Now it's on. It's on? Yeah. It, okay. Is it just for recording or is it also it's broadcast it's here? Also for also for the it's coming out of these speakers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just leave it there. I may use it, I may not. Okay, that sounds good. Right, so welcome back everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker, the second lecturer of today on collider physics. It's Matthew Schwartz from Harvard. He, probably you know already him, is an expert in uh, quantum field theory, collider physics, QCD. You might know him of, by stud, studying QC, QFT on his book. Maybe part, of, part of you probably learned QC, QFT from him. And, uh, well, enjoy. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, it's great to see uh, such a lively audience. I, I uh, enjoyed Yuval's lecture, and um, I want to echo some of the points he made. Uh, you know, this only works if you ask questions, so if I'm saying something that you don't understand, please ask. Uh, I'll also try to start from sort of basic things uh, and, um, and develop in sophistication depending on time and interest uh, as we go along. Um, uh, the, goal, the goal, so my, oh, question already, perfect. You can't hear me. Um, I could talk louder, or we can move the microphone, or maybe raise the volume. Uh, let me try moving it up more. Uh, how, is that better? Yes, OK. Um, so again, I've heard that there's a, a sort of a, a mixed audience here, people of different levels and different backgrounds. Uh, how many people here are in master's programs right now? OK. How many are in PhD programs? How many are uh, in a bachelor's program? How many are not in any program? <laughs> How many did I not mention? OK. Um, I, I just, OK, so there's a, a good mix. Most PhD students um, and some master's students. Uh, I also want to get a sense of where you're all from. I've heard there's 50, 50 countries represented here. Um, how many people here are from Europe? Okay, so that's maybe half. How many from Asia? Third. How many from Africa? Uh, how many three? From North America? South America? Um, Australasia? Did I forget anything? Um, OK, so it's quite, it is, it's quite a, a mixed group, and it's great to, to see all these people. Um, so uh, I'm going to give lectures. So the topic of my lectures is collider physics. I'm going to sort of give you uh, an overview of the interface between more formal things you might learn in a quantum field theory course or a particle physics course, and how it's actually useful in practice to understand the, where basically the sort of historically how we learned about the standard model in particle physics, but, but mainly what's going on now in particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider and how to think about uh, studying the Large Hadron Collider from a theoretical point of view. What are the kinds of things we can measure and what, what can we learn um, about it, which is really the interface between what we have now and hopefully what we'll have um, uh, in the future. 
And again, please ask questions as we go along. I'll stop at the end, of course, to take more questions. But, but the more questions we have during the lectures, the better. And, and feel free also to ask me just general, general questions about uh, you know, quantum field theory, anything you want. Um, but maybe those more general questions save towards the end of the discussion sessions. Um, uh, so uh, I have three lectures, not seven, so I won't be able to cover that much. The, the goal of today's lecture is to sort of give you an, interview, an overview of colliders, particularly the Large Hadron Collider, to talk a little bit about its design and, and why it's designed the way it is and how it works, um, and then moving into the kinds of things that we can see at the Large Hadron Collider. And then I'll start talking about different kinds of particles we can see and how we see them and how to, how to construct observables and estimate things um, that we're interested in. Um, so uh, just some, some references before we start. The main reference for these lectures are a set of um, uh, lecture notes that I wrote for some, uh, the Tassie Summer School um, two years ago, oh, four, five, two, three, and this will cover a lot of what I'm actually saying. Uh, I'll also give this to, to put on the ICTP uh, website, but you can look at here if you want more details um, about what I'm doing. Uh, other, other lecture notes, so this is There's lecture notes by Tao Han that I like, uh, which is H 05 um, And another good reference is the, uh, a book, QCD, Lighter Physics. Um, by Ellis. And Weber. Sometimes it's known as the pink book because it has a pink cover. Um, anyway, this is a very comprehensive uh, uh, um, summary of a lot of interesting ideas in collider physics that get to QCD. This is a set of lecture notes similar to what I'm doing with a slightly different perspective, and this is more or less the kinds of things I'm going to say. Um, okay, so let's talk about, let's get started by talking about the Large Hadron Collider. As you all probably know, the Large Hadron Collider is um, uh, located on the border between Switzerland and France um, uh, near, near Geneva. It is a 27-kilometer circumference. Um, it's supposed to the design the center of mass energy Thirteen TV. Um, it's going to ramp up to fourteen TV. It's currently on shutdown and ran until last fall. Um, well, it was the second run, and now it's a long shutdown until two thousand twenty-one, when it'll turn on again. Um, and what we'd like to understand is why is it so big? Um, why and and uh, how would you design such? A, why was it designed the way it is? Um, so. Uh, to get started, the, the most important concept in collider physics is the notion of a cross-section. Um, you guys know what, what, are the, what are the appropriate units of cross-sections that we use in collider physics? Barn, right. So, so what is a barn? So one barn, 10 to the minus 28 square meters. Does anyone know why it's called a barn? Does anyone know what a barn is? A barn is that big red thing that I have in, on farms. Um, and there's a, a, a saying that you couldn't, your, your aim is so bad you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Um, but this, this unit comes from uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, who was doing nuclear physics and trying to make uh, uh, nuclear fission. And a lot of it is bombardment of neutrons on uh, uranium. And he had a problem that he couldn't keep the neutrons from hitting the uranium. So it was sort of the opposite. He couldn't hit them. So from the point of view of a neutron, a uranium was an enormous thing, like the broadside of a barn, um, that seemed to have a very large cross-sectional area. Um, but that's one way of remembering what this unit is. It's roughly the cross-section for um, uh, proton uranium-235 scattering. Um, so it's basically the or neutron uranium scattering. So it's basically the cross-section for a neutron to scatter off uranium with a kind of inelastic collision to have it form something else. Um, so. Uh, 
Using this, can we figure out what the cross-section is? The main thing that the LHC is colliding is protons. Uh, so if this is the cross-section for a neutron to scatter off of a uranium-235, what is the cross-section for a proton to scatter off a proton? Well, well, so a neutron, from the point of view of scattering, mostly it's done through the strong interaction. So you can't tell the difference between a neutron um, and a proton. And uranium, you could think of as 235 nucleons, which are protons or neutrons. So we could have this picture of a neutron coming in and scattering off of this blob of 235 nucleons. Um, and what we know is that the cross-sectional area, which is roughly the, the, the area seen by a neutron that's coming in, um, is, is given by this unit of, of one barn. So if there's 235 of this, you could say that the um, the volume of this goes like 235. Uh, so then the area goes like 235 um, to the 2 thirds. Um, so what we want to know is what's the cross-section for a single nucleon scattering off of a single nucleon. So we're only sensitive to the cross-sectional area. So from this, we can say that the proton-proton cross-section should be the neutron-uranium cross-section times a relative uh, area factor. So uh, if the neutron cross-section is the cross-section for a proton scattering times 235 to the 2 thirds, then we put the 235 on the other side to the minus 2 thirds. Um, so what, what is that? Well, this is maybe a hundredth. So this is maybe uh, a, a tenth. So we can work out the numbers here. And it's uh, um, roughly, uh, so this is one barn. Um, times 0 0.03, 30 millibarns. So this is the typical scale for proton-proton cross-sections. Um, it's a little bit less than a barn, so a barn is a neutron scattering off of a proton. But for proton-proton cross-sections, we're down by you know, one and a half orders of magnitude um, to 30 millibarns. Uh, so this is the typical cross-section at the LHC. Of course, it changes a little bit with energy, but roughly this is the scale for proton-proton scaling. It, it, it changes logarithmically with energy, but this sort of sets the units for, for collisions. Um, um. So another way to estimate this is just to think about a cross-section. So what's the, what do we know the size of a proton is? How big is it? Like, what's the radius of protons? Roughly, yeah. 0.8 Fermi. What's a Fermi? Right. So the radius of a proton is around, let's, let's drop the 0.8, one femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15 um, meters, uh, the radius of a proton. So roughly speaking, the, the area, the cross-sectional area of a proton is going to be pi rp squared, um, which is 3 times 10 to the minus uh, 30 meters. 30 millibarns. You get roughly the same, the same number calculating those different ways. Right? So this really, you should think of it just classically as the cross-sectional area of a proton. Um, and of course, cross-sections, quantum mechanically, represent a generalization of that. Because if it's a cross-sectional area, when, you, when two things collide, if this was within this area, it'll scatter for sure. Um, but quantum mechanically, you only have a probability of scattering. But that probability to have the same, the right classical limit should be interpretable as a cross-sectional area. So we generalize the idea of a cross-sectional area to the uh, more abstract thing called a cross-section. But physically, it represents the, the same thing. We just calculate it in a different way. So you can think of it as, as basically the cross-sectional area um, um, of, 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 of a proton. Um, so how do you think about this? So now if we have a beam, so the, the Large Hadron Collider will collide protons in beams. Um, right? it, it's colliding individual protons, but you don't know exactly where it is. What you have is a sort of the width of a beam, um, which is typically around uh, 10 microns, which is 10 to the minus 5 uh, uh, meters. So the area of the beam is around 10 to the minus 10 square meters. And so if the, uh, the cross-section of proton-proton scattering is 10 to the minus 30 meters, what that means is if I have a beam and I have a proton coming in, and say I have another beam, the chance for the protons to scatter off of each other is, if I know that it's somewhere in this area, um, 
which is the order 10 to the minus 10, then the probability of scattering, just classically, is going to be the, it, it grows with the cross section, so 10 to the minus 30 to the squared divided by the area of the beam, 10 to the minus 10 meters squared, which is around 10 to the minus 20. Um, so for a typical beam size, I'll need to have 10 to the 20 protons go past um, before one of them scatters. Um, but that means that I need to put a lot of protons in the beam. So typical protons will have uh, uh, bunches of protons. Typical beam will have bunches of protons around 10 to the 11 protons in a bunch. And if you're scattering two of these, you'll get 10 to the 11 squared, um, which is 10 to the 22, which is bigger than 10 to the outweighs the minus 10 to the minus 20. So you'll get around 100 protons scattering when each of these bunches cross. Um, so that's typical design of the LHC. But let's try to understand that a little better. Why, why, what, how many protons do we need? Why should we like 100 protons to scatter off of each other? Um, what is the design? Because it's very difficult to get a lot of protons together so you do have a lot of scattering. That's called the luminosity. Um, and so the question is, how much, what luminosity should we need for a collider like the LHC to be productive? Um, that is, what kind of cross-sections are we trying to probe? So this is just the total proton scattering, the total inelastic PP scattering cross-section. But of course, we're not interested in just scattering protons and breaking them apart. Um, we were once, but now we're interested in more exotic things, like producing W bosons or Higgs bosons, um, or tops, or supersymmetry, or all kinds of things. And so to do that, we want the probability of scattering where we replace the total inelastic proton-proton cross-section with the cross-section for the thing we're interested in. Uh, so for example, what is the cross-section for a proton-proton scattering into a W boson? Does anyone know what this is? Can anyone estimate it? Don't want you to tell me the answer, but use something you know. So this is a weak process, right? This is the W boson represents the force for weak interactions. So beta decay is mediated by the uh, proton. Uh, what, what is the rate for beta decay? Do you know the constant used to describe the weak interactions? Your G Fermi. Um, so what is G Fermi? Do you know what it is? You have to speak up. You don't have a microphone. Ten to the minus five GeV to the minus two, right? But roughly, what it is is it's it's so you have proton proton and you have a W boson being exchanged, so you get uh, couplings here. So it looks like G squared over MW squared, and that sets this is G Fermi up to some factors of two. Um, which is also, you can write it as 1 over roughly 100 GeV squared. So this is 1 over 100 in GeV squared, and if we try to convert that um, to units of, of cross-section, um, uh, 10 to the minus 6, uh, uh, millibarn, which is 10 to the minus 9 barn, the simple units, which is also known as one nanobar. Right? So that's a typical weak scale cross section. Uh, again, to see this by dimensional analysis, so this, uh, we said a proton is determined by the scale of, of a Fermi. Right? A Fermi is the size of a proton, uh, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters. It, it's helpful to think of that also as a scale. So this is the, the scale associated with it is 200 MeV inverse. So 200 MeV you should think of as the strong coupling scale. So a proton is a GeV, but it's of order 200 MeV. But this is a useful conversion that a Fermi is around. Oh, this is the board I shouldn't write on because it's dark. But anyway, this is a useful thing to remember. A Fermi, which is the typical size of the proton, is around uh, 200 MeV inverse, which is the typical size of lambda QCD, or the strong coupling scale. Um, uh, and so these are, these are useful units. And so now we're going from 200 MeV to 100 GeV, so we get a factor of 10 to the 3, and then we square it, so we get 10 to the 6. So that's this 10 to the 6, right? So the, 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 the cross-section for a weak process is typically down from the inelastic proton-proton cross-section by a factor of a million. So what does this mean? This means that we have to collide a million protons to get one W boson. Every time we collide protons together, so, so every time we have a bunch pass by, we get about 100 proton-proton collisions. And we need a million proton-proton collisions in order to get a single W boson. Um, now, this was exciting at, at previous machines. That, you know, UA1, UA2 in the early 80s were producing W bosons for proton collisions. 
Uh, but we want something uh, uh, rarer, which is uh, Higgs bosons. Um, so there's different ways to produce a Higgs, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into them, and maybe Yuval will get into them in his, in his lectures. Um, so, so you have to know something about how to produce a Higgs boson to estimate this. But this is also, the Higgs boson is essentially a weak interacting process. This, the dominant production for a Higgs boson is a loop process through a top quark. Uh, um, and then you get a weak interaction. And generally, when you have a loop, things are suppressed compared to leading order, not because of factors of h bar, which is 1, but because of numerical factors of, of order pi. So you get something of order 1 over 16 pi squared times sigma weak scale. Oh, let me write this as g Fermi. Typically, so you get something like another factor of 1,000, 10 to the minus 3 nanobarns, which is order of picobarns. Again, these are just rough estimates. They can be off by factors of you know, 10 or something. And in fact, there's other production channels. The, 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 the real cross-section is closer to 40 picobarns. But it's a reasonable estimate. And the cross-section for W is also a little bit bigger than a nanobarn. Um, and again, it depends a little bit on energy and so on. But, but, but the point here is we're down by another factor of 10 to the 3, another factor of 1,000. And what this means is we have to collide a billion protons to produce one Higgs boson. Right? And this is known, I mean, this was known for a long time. It depends, of course, on the Higgs boson mass. So before the LHC turned on, we didn't know what energy to make it. Um, we didn't know exactly what the cross-section is. But no matter how you, how you, uh, no matter how you do it, no matter what the Higgs boson mass is, uh, roughly speaking, you're going to need around, you want to design the machine to be sensitive to things that are produced by one part in a billion. So one in a billion proton collisions has to be uh, uh, an observable process. So that roughly, that roughly um, gives you a sense of what we need for the Large Hadron Collider. So, so given OK, so we want, uh, say we want 100 Higgs bosons. All right, that might be a typical goal. So say we run for a year, we should be able to discover the Higgs boson. Um, uh, what, uh, how many? Protons collide. Okay, so we already said that when we collide, well, we so we have a ten to the minus twenty uh, chance of the protons scattering when we when we collide them in a typical beam size. Um, now, of course, one thing you can do is shrink the beam size to increase this number. You can also put more protons in the beam. And we want to kind of know how to put together these factors to know how many protons we need to get close enough to each other uh, uh, to, 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 to scatter. Um, that is, what is the, and, and this amounts to the luminosity of the collider. Okay, so let's just do some more dimensional analysis. So we said, um, let me get my... So we said um, 10 to the 9 proton collisions, 1 Higgs. Right, that's what we just calculated. That's because proton collision cross-section is around 10 millibarns, and a Higgs cross-section is around um, 10 picobarns. So that's a factor of 10 to the 9 difference. Uh, so a typical, we need to also factor in things like branching ratio of the way we actually see it. So one of the Higgs discovery modes, one of the most important ones, was Higgs and gamma gamma, which has a branching ratio of 10 to the minus 3. That means of every Higgs, every, we have 1,000 Higgs produced in order for one of them to decay into this way that we can see it. Uh, the dominant way that Higgs decays into B quarks and B jets, and those are very hard to see and have enormous backgrounds. So this was sort of one of the design goals of the LHC, is to be sensitive to this, right? Um, so if we want 100 Higgs, we need 100 times 10 to the 9, but now we need 100 times 10 to the 12. Um, uh, so let's say um, there's also efficiencies. So efficiencies are things like you, you don't see all of the production. So the Higgs might decay to photons, but they go down the, where the beam was. So you don't see them. 
or most of the time the LHC is not running, right? It only runs for some fraction of the year. Um, so you can estimate this and just, you know, we'll say it's maybe 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2, something like that. Right? So what we have, we have um, 100 Higgs bosons. So uh, say 10 to the minus 2 for the Higgs bosons. Say 10 to the minus 3 for the branching ratio. 10 to the minus 2 for efficiencies. So we get 10 to the minus 7. So we have to pay this hit of 10 to the minus 7. Um, uh, so this is roughly compensated by, so there's roughly 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. Um, um, so, so this says that we need, uh, let's see. So here we said we needed um, 10 to the 9 protons to produce a Higgs. Now we're saying we need 10 to the 16 protons in a year. Right? 10 to the second year means we need 10 to the 9 uh, protons per second. Right? So we have to design the machine to collide around a billion protons per second. Okay, this is the, the, the key unit here, which is around 1 gigahertz. Right, so, uh, so 10 to the 9 is a billion, so a gigahertz is 10 to the 9 per second. So this is a typical design. When they're designing the LHC, this is what they needed. They needed to set it up such that they can have uh, 10 to the 9 uh, protons collide per second. 10 to the 9, a billion inelastic proton collisions every second, um, which is a lot. Um, there's a question? No, no, this is just, this is like how, how much the detector is running. So for a typical year, most of the time it's not running and it has to speed up. You have to have the beams uh, scale them up. So you only get 10% or, you know, 1% of the actual time in a year actually running to produce these things. Um, but also, it also includes other things like detector efficiencies and the you know, detector not being on when you take experiments, but also photons that go down the beam. It's just an estimate, right? There's some number of order that. So maybe it's, Maybe we're down by an order of magnitude here. Maybe we're up by an order of magnitude. We're just trying to get a sense, right? You want to be conservative about these things in order to uh, make sure you don't miss the thing. OK. Uh, OK, so how do we achieve this? Well, as I said, the, the LHC collides um, protons in bunches. So the way it works is you have this big beam, which is 27 kilometers around. Um, and it, the way it works is you have protons in bunches, where there's around 10 to the 11 uh, protons per bunch. So it's not continuously colliding protons. It's colliding them in these bunches. And the bunches are separated by uh, 25 nanoseconds. So every 25 nanoseconds, a bunch passes by another bunch. So they have bunches going this way and also a bunch is going that way. Um, and there's interaction points at different parts of the detector. So Atlas might be down here, CMS might be around here, and LHCB would be over there, and Elise might be over there. So there's around the ring, there's four, four main detectors. Uh, I guess I should write that since I wrote the other ones. Um, with, with slightly different designs. But so, the, so what happens is these bunches of beams go around and then the beam is focused down to this 10 micron scale at different points around the beam. Normally, it might be a millimeter wide, and then it, as it's accelerating, and then they'll focus it down using um, a, a, a special magnet to collide them at the shortest possible scale. And of course, the smaller the beam spot is, if you can get below 10 microns, you can increase the luminosity. Uh, and so the goal is to do that at different, different places. So 25 nanoseconds, so this is 25 times uh, 10 to the minus 9 seconds, which is also uh, 1 over 40 megahertz. So the rate for the beams, to the, the bunches to pass each other is 40 megahertz. And what we're looking for is a gigahertz uh, array. So the, the rate, the beam crossing rate is uh, 40 megahertz. So 40 megahertz differs from 1 gigahertz by around a factor of 100. right? This means we need 
100 collisions uh, per bunch crossing. OK, so this is the typical design of the LHG, and this is basically how it works. You have these beams with around 10 to 11 protons. They collide in these uh, beam spots around 10 microns, and each time they collide, you have this factor of 10 to the minus 20 from the beam crossing, uh, and you have so 10 to the 11 squared. So we have 10 to the 11 uh, squared times uh, sigma pp divided by uh, area of beam. Um, was around 100. So then you get 100 uh, pp per crossing. So this was the calculation we did before. So that's basically how it works. So you collide the protons. So you know that maybe the early runs of the LHC, you'd only have maybe one or two collisions per bunch crossing. But when it ramps up, you get to around 100. The high luminosity LHC might see as high as 500 collisions per bump crossing. Keep in mind that the higher this number gets, the harder it is to actually see anything, because you have 100 collisions all at the same time that are basically indistinguishable. So you get all this enormous background from the thing you want. It's not just backgrounds you can calculate from uh, the, the same collision. They're not like, you know, background to Higgs to two photons might be uh, just, you know, two, uh, a pion decaying to two photons. Uh, but these backgrounds are you produce 100 different pions from different protons colliding, and you have to figure out which photons came from which pions. Um, and that's a, that's a big mess. Um, so uh, when you increase the luminosity to get, to get this high, you also have bigger backgrounds from pileup, from, uh, from protons colliding, from uh, uh, different protons colliding in the same bunch. You also have what's called out of time pileup, where 25 nanoseconds is a short time. It's short enough time so that you could have a bunch crossing, and then things basically move out at the speed of light. Right? So, but by the time 25 nanoseconds later, you have the next bunch come in, and your other collision hasn't left the detector. The detector, these, these detectors are as big as this lecture hall, or bigger, right? They're 100 meters tall, right? And so at 25 nanoseconds, you can go around 10 meters. So you go 10 meters, and then the next collision comes, and you go another 10 meters. So in 100 meters, you might have 10 different collisions populating through the detector at the same time. So it's an incredible uh, 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 computational challenge to sort this all out and figure out which came from which time, but, but they have great timing information in these detectors to, 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 to sort it all out. Um, so units, uh, so, so a typical unit, this, you don't always write 100 collisions for bunch crossing. The typical units for luminosity are We talk about different kinds of luminosity. We talk about the instantaneous luminosity. Uh, so it might be something like 2 times 10 to the 34, 1 over centimeters squared per second. So these are, these are funny units. And um, you could also write this as 20 hertz per nanobarn. Uh, these are weird units. You've never seen them before. It takes a while to process what's actually going on. Uh, I think the easiest way to write this is 20 inverse nanobarn per second. So we've taken inverses of various things. Uh, in fact, let me write it as 20 nanobarn inverse. Um, so we, we typically talk about uh, integrated cross-section, so the total luminosity. Uh, L is the integral over time of the instantaneous luminosity, and we call this L. And so this might have a unit of something like um, 100 inverse femtobarns. Right. So in 2018, the experiments got around 60 inverse femtobarns either, each. Uh, these are typical units. So it, this would say that you get 20 inverse nanobarns per second. So a nanobarn is 10 to the minus 12, and a femtobarn is 10 to the um, nanobarn is 10 to the minus 9, and a femtobarn is 10 to the minus 15. So you got to have to have a million seconds. So it roughly runs for a million seconds, and you get uh, 20 inverse 
uh, femtobarns, 100 femtobarns, you run for uh, five times 10 to the six seconds, something like that, which is down by you know, order of magnitude from the number of seconds in a year. Um, um, but anyway, these are typical scales. So this, this is the, people used to use this unit a lot more. Now you see this more commonly. Um, but you can translate between them without too much work. It's, when, you, when you see them a lot, you get intuition for it. Um, but, the, but this is a typical, I think this was the peak. This was the maximum instantaneous luminosity at the LHC. Um, so, but, but roughly, I think in 2018, they got around 60, and they got maybe 50 the year before. So each experiment got maybe 100. And so there's maybe 200 image femtobarns barns is the total amount of luminosity recorded at the LHC. Um, and once you know this number, you can translate back into cross-section. So if the Higgs boson production cross-section uh, is of order 30 picobarns, um, I have, uh, so something like that. So if, if the, so if the cross-section for PP to Higgs 30 picobarns, uh, then in 100 inverse femtobarns, so if 100 inverse femtobarns is 100 times 10 to the 3 inverse picobarns, which is 10 to the, 10 to the 5 inverse picobarns, so it's 10 to the 4, uh, uh, 10 to the 6 times 30 picobarns, 10 to the 6 times 1 over 30 picobarns. So that means we produced about a million Higgses um, so far at the LHC, right? And of which, so if the Higgs to gamma gamma is a factor of 10 to the 3, we produced about 1,000 Higgs to gamma gamma events, right? Most of the Higgses decay to BB bar. Um, a lot of them we didn't see at all. But these are typical numbers, right? So we're well in excess of the 100 we needed to produce um, to see it, um, but not that much in excess. So the LHC is kind of doing what we expected. If you have a process with a cross-section three orders of magnitude smaller than the Higgs production cross-section, of which there are plenty, you know, producing, I don't know, uh, uh, resonances in extra dimensions or, or gluinos or something like that, where the cross-section is, say, an atobarn and, or a, a, a femtobarn. So if something has a cross-section of a femtobarn, then with 100 inverse femtobarns, you might have produced 100 of them. Um, if it's an atobarn, you haven't produced any yet, right? And so the goal for the high luminosity LHC is to accumulate around 250 inverse femtobarns a year, um, but maybe finally at the end of the LHC, we might get two out of barns or something like that, a total recorded luminosity. Then we need a new machine. There's only so much you can do. And again, as you increase luminosity, pileup becomes a problem, these extra collisions at the same bunch crossing, and so on, so it becomes a mess. Uh, okay. Uh, to say about this, yeah, good. So, um, okay, so we have this, this collision rate. So the LHC achieves around a gigahertz collision rate. Um, so gigahertz, so, is, uh, so you guys are familiar with this unit of gigahertz, right? Probably from like the processes on your computers, right? Anyone know how fast your computer runs? What are the units? Megahertz, gigahertz, hertz? Gigahertz? Right. Okay, so, so what does a gigahertz on a computer mean? It means it does a billion processes, a billion operations per second, right? So that's like adding two numbers. It can do that a billion times a second, right? But here we're colliding, we're, we're, we're producing, we're having a billion inelastic proton collisions a second. Right? So you want to be able to process that with your computer that could do one addition a second. Right? And that seems kind of challenging because you, you, you could either have a lot of computers all working in, in, um, in common, but you need to do the, the, the computational challenge of understanding the LHC data is significant. Um, okay, so we have uh, roughly a one gigahertz uh, a collision rate. Um, a typical event um, is around one megabyte, right? So that was one megabyte is a million bytes, right? So basically the information that you get out of an event, which means recording where all the particles go the best you can, uh, takes about a million bytes to record that information. So if we have a billion collisions a second, we need a million billion bytes recorded to disk 
a second if we're going to record all of that, um, which is, of course, impossible. Um, so we have a problem that we need to reduce this gigahertz rate down to something that's uh, uh, more manageable, right? Um, so what we could record about, well, can you estimate it? Like from your computers, how, how fast can computers transfer information? Can you do a megabyte a second? Can you do a million megabytes a second? Can you do a billion megabytes a second? No. So what, what do you think the best computers in the world could do? Could they do a billion megabytes a second? Sounds like a lot. Of course, you had a billion of them, you can, right? But we don't, have a, we don't have room for a billion of them because we have the same detector producing the same information. You've got to connect all the wires and be able to record that data coming from each individual wire at a billion. So you can, you can try to parallelize it about as you can, but you can record typically around um, 200 megabytes per second, right? which is a lot faster than your computer can do. But again, this is within the context of the LHC. Um, so we started off producing uh, a billion megabytes per second, and we have to reduce it to 200 megabytes per second. And that's called the problem of, of triggering. Um, so we need to reduce. Um, from one gigahertz, 200 hertz, right? Um, so each collision is, so the units of megabyte are the units of events. So we went from producing um, uh, a billion events a second, and we can record 200 events per second. So how do we decide which of the billion events we want to record to, to disk? And we have to do that at the hardware level mostly, because by the time we've recorded it, we do the analysis. Um, we must have reduced it before we could do that. Um, so this is called the triggering problem. Problem. I don't know what the problem, but it's just something you have to do when you design, design um, um, an experiment. So the way it works is we have a trigger table. And so you have to put cuts. You can't record everything. And you have to decide what you record. And to the best possible, you have to be able to decide that on the spot locally in the detector, because it's hard to process global information about the whole event at once. Uh, so there's things like we look for one isolated electron um, with PT greater than 25 G. Sorry about the squeaking. So this means we can't record every event that has an electron in it. Um, but if we record, we ask for a single electron to have more than 25 GeV um, of, um, or we can look for uh, two isolated electrons with uh, PT greater than 15 GeV. So together, these add up to around 40 hertz, right? So we get. A billion, out of the billion collisions per second of protons, we, uh, 40 of them satisfy these criteria. We can ask for one photon greater than 60 GeV, so on, which is another 40 hertz. Uh, we can ask for muons and taus and jets and so on. And so you, you figure out for each of these how many, how many you get, and the total should add up to around 200. And again, it varies with luminosity. So at higher luminosity, you need to have weaker triggers, right? So for example, if we're running, uh, instead of one gigahertz, two gigahertz, then we have to cut these by a factor. So we might say at, at so, so for example, looking for jets, right? At the LHC, you have to require jets to have uh, PT greater than 400 GeV, right? If they're less than that, then you have more than, than you can handle, right? So already, this gives you something like a 20 hertz. Uh, but if I ran the LHC to run at 2 gigahertz, or say, uh, I don't know, 8 times 10 to the minus, 20, minus 34 inverse centimeters per second, um, uh, uh, then you might get, you know, have to increase the cut on jets to be, I don't know, uh, 600 GeV. So these, these trigger tables all scale with luminosity. Uh, anyway, so the, the lesson here is that you can't record anything, and you need to know when you're doing analysis of the LHC, you can't just make up some process and say, LHC, go find it. 
because if it doesn't satisfy one of these triggers, it's not recorded. They're just incapable of recording um, uh, everything. Uh, and so the first lesson is when you're trying to see if, hey, I have this model of supersymmetry or whatever, can we see it? You have to know that it's actually going to be seen, and that, that requires the LHC to satisfy some of this trigger. And actually, over the last 10 years, uh, theorists have come in and said, listen, you guys, have, you're not recording the right things, and you need to modify this trigger table to find my model of beyond the standard model physics or whatever. But, but there's been a sort of more active discussion among the experimental community who pick these triggers based on ideas from the 80s um, to adapting to more modern ideas from, from theory uh, uh, about what should be seen and what, what, what can't be seen. Are there, are there questions about this? Uh, well, I didn't write them down, but there's some, so this is a, you know, two muons. I just didn't write them, you know, greater than 10 GV, you know, a tau, 5 GV. I mean, they, they vary by experiment, and they keep changing them with time, so I don't have up-to-date versions of all of them, but, um, but yeah. Cuts on these transverse momenta that you have, um, how, I'm sorry. The cuts on the transverse momenta, how are they decided? Yeah, um, so or if you made it bigger, if, if I'm, if you want to take them as low as possible so you can keep as much as possible, um, and you have to trade up so all these numbers have to add up to 200, right? So if I made this 5 GV, this might be 500 hertz, and then everything I recorded would be electrons, and I want to also be able to record other stuff, right? So the trade-off is you want to record as much as possible, and, you know, the guy working in the electron group has to fight the guy working in the QCD group for over triggers, and some compromise was made to record a little bit of everything constantly questions and everybody always wants to lower them and um, it's sort of, you have to use physics principles, what's most likely, what's most interesting based on the goals of different physics groups. Yeah, good question. Other questions about this? So during, the whole, during a run, different triggers will be being applied to the detector? Yeah, yeah, so during, I mean even, Right, during, I don't want to say, the, yeah. when the LHC is colliding these, every, every 25 nanoseconds, a bunch collides, right? And most of the bunches, they won't record anything, right? So that's 40 megahertz already of, of, of collision rate. So, so you have to throw out almost all, everything from every bunch crossing um, in order to see, to see anything. But then out of the 40 megahertz, you have to get down to 200 hertz. So that means that one out of every, I don't know, million or so collisions you record, and then you save everything from the whole collision. Oh, no, no, I mean, wouldn't different groups want different triggers for, like, these, like, a different trigger table for each one? Do, do they just run different ones throughout the... No, no, they're all running at the same time. Programs. So if any of these is satisfied, the whole event is recorded, right? And so you can set these once and for all, and again, this makes it so you record one in every, you know, million bunch crossings, so you get down to 200, 200 hertz, right? So remember, the LHC is colliding a million protons every second, by these beams coming in, I mean, a million bunches every second, and out of those, you can only take two every second, 200 every second of, of events can actually be saved, right? So they have this set of tables, and some of them are done at hardware level, so very low level, using the silicon where the, you know, see if there's tracks for displaced vertices for B-tagging triggers, and some of them are high-level things where they can reconstruct jets and look for the invariant mass of two jets to be higher than something. And so the lower level triggers have to be, the, the, the biggest reductions have to be done earlier on. So it's sort of a staircase of, of of escalating triggers of increasing complexity. Um, and now actually they do run, when they're the redesigned the LHC, they're putting new, more sophisticated hardware triggers in so they can do things at a low level and look for more interesting. Um, but it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of science and technology that goes into doing this at all. And of course, as com computing capacity increases, we can increase this from 200 hertz to um, uh, you know, kilohertz, right? And that helps a lot too. And there's also the data storage, right? The LHC records a order of a petabyte a year of data and you have to analyze that. And, um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really want to talk about the, the storage requirements, but maybe it's worth knowing. So the LHC, the data, there's one copy of everything that's ever recorded at the LHC that stays at CERN, and then another copy is distributed to uh, tier one centers all over, the, all over the world. And then from those tier one centers, there's tier two centers, which are level of, say, a, of a city. Maybe a few universities in the same area will share. Um, and then there's tier three, which is an individual university. So it's a distributed level where you have one copy localized at CERN, one copy distributed, and then that data gets picked out for certain 
certain processes. If someone at a university is doing you know, a dimuon search, they'll ask for the ones that satisfy the muon trigger, and they'll record those, so they don't need to deal with the petabytes of data all on their own. Um, um, and and you know, transporting the data is actually a, a formidable challenge also. Um, so when you, trig oh, when you trigger, what actually gets written to tape at the end of the day? The whole event, so every part of The whole bunch crossing? Uh, like all collisions yeah. in the same punch crossing? So again, what, what you're recording, so okay, what is a detector? Um, so what are they actually seeing? So, um, so you'll have, so here's a kind of a sketch of Atlas. It has these kind of things at the end, and then it's a big tube like that, and then has these other end cap things. So Atlas kind of looks like that. Um, so the beam will come in here, one beam coming this way, one beam coming in this way. And again, just for scale, this is around 100 meters. And they'll collide right in the middle of Atlas, right? So again, there's these tensely 11 protons, right? And you might have 100 of them collide within bunch, and you have particles. Now, most of these collisions are called minimum bias. So the protons don't necessarily collide head on, and you don't have some hard scattering within the proton. You just kind of, it smashes apart and produces a bunch of soft pi out. So low energy stuff that just kind of circles away in the magnetic field and nothing interesting happens. But sometimes you'll get something interesting. Uh, you know, one in, a, one in a billion times you'll get a Higgs boson, and you might get something hard. Uh, and so the way these detectors are designed is close to the beam, they have the, the silicon. In silicon, there's different levels of this. There's the pixels, which are the highest resolution silicon, um, which is very close to the beam line. So the idea here is that you measure charged particles. You measure tracks of charged particles. Uh, charged tracks. Right, so this is the most useful information because you'll see it bend. You have strong fields near the beam and you can see where the particle is. You can measure what the charge is. It's positive or negative, but also from the curvature you can measure the momentum. Um, and there's a cascading level of complexity. So there's the, the pixels and then there's the transition radiation tracker um, um, and there's other silicon trackers all close to the beam that measure different things. Um, outside of it you have the calorimeter. So you'll have what's called the eCal which is the electromagnetic calorimeter. So that measures charged particles. Basically, it measures photons and electrons, gamma and E minus, and protons and so on. Anything charged um, will, will show up in this electromagnetic calorimeter. And then the outside of the detector is the, well, then there's another layer here, which is the hadronic calorimeter, HL. Um, and so this measures protons and neutrons, anything and, and pions, um, anything that has strong interactions. And then the final stage, this, the reason it's so big, is the muon system. The muons are very weakly interacting. Uh, and to see them at all, you need, well, to, to measure their momentum, you need to have a big enough field so that they come out straight and then they sort of bend a little. And you're looking for that curvature. And that's how you can tell the momentum of a muon. So the problem with the muon, everything else deposits all of their energy before it leaves the detector. So, so mostly, well, mostly what the LHC produces is pions. You know, nine out of 10 particles at the LHC are pions. Uh, pions are either pi plus, pi minus, um, which are essentially stable from the point of view of the detector. They show up in the electromagnetic calorimeter, about a third of their energy is deposited there, and the rest of it's deposited in the hadronic calorimeter, and they don't get out of the detector. Um, and they produce some set of protons, and they produce electrons. Electrons leave tracks in the silicon, then they show up in the electromagnetic calorimeter, but they don't show up in the hadronic calorimeter. Um, but they're strongly interacting from an electromagnetic point of view because they're light, and so basically they deposit all of their energy to the eCal. The muons are weakly interacting, and they're usually produced hard, so they produce some energy in the eCal, but mostly they just go out of the detector and don't interact at all in the hadronic calorimeter and leave the detector. Um, so you try to measure their, you figure out their energy because they leave, you don't get all of it, so you can't measure it from a calorimetry, you have to measure it from the track. So you need a big enough system to see the curvature of the track, um, especially for very energetic muons. Um, so that being said, what the experiments try to do is measure everything they can. So the experiment is mostly pions, but protons, photons, muons, protons, neutrons, uh, things like that. And you try to see for every particle, identify it if you can, figure out exactly what it is. That's hard, but at least you can get all of its energy. Um, so the output, this megabyte um, of information, is every, every uh, detector response. Right? So every time a particle moves on and the detector lights up, they have timing information. When did it happen? And you need that timing information to separate one collision from the next. Uh, um, and the energy information, so how strong was the signal? 
um, in different regions of the calorimeter. So each calorimeter has its own circuit that determines what's going on there. Uh, and, the, and the information recorded, once any of the triggers passed, is all of the signals recorded from all the detector components of the whole detector. Right? That's the signal of the event. And then offline, you can process that and reduce it down to a set of you know, four vectors or whatever you want to represent the information from the particles. Uh, but, but the thing that's actually recorded is the raw detector information from the different electronics used to measure the particles. Um, so either, either you record all of it or you record none of it. It doesn't make any sense to record some of it. Um, and that's the, the, the point of a detector is like the LHC. Can I ask where the bottleneck is in recording only 200 megabytes per second? Because we have storage media that are much faster. Is this just because it has to be on tape or something? Uh, well, you have storage. So what, what, how fast do you want, right? I mean, we don't have things that can record a gigahertz, right? So, so a, a, a billion megabytes per second. We don't have anything that can do that. We right? have storage media that can record like two gigabytes per second. Two gigabytes per second? OK, so two gigabytes per second is still a factor of a million below what you need. Yeah, yeah, sure. I was right. just wondering so how. So it's a trade-off. And it's not, it's not necessarily the latest technology. It's the technology in the mid-90s when this thing was being built. Right? Okay. And of course, electronics is upgraded. Um, and, and you also have to be able to put it in the, in the system. right? So you have to record the information locally. So you have to be able to distribute it around. You know, I mean, they need things for this timing information. They need to know the length of the wires that, that, that's going through the detector. So, so it's a challenge, and there's a historical element to it, right? And certainly for new designs, you can use the latest technology, but there's limitations. As you know, it grows exponentially, the technology. So you're, 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 you're stuck with the things that you have and the practical components of where you put it and what is the actual information that's coming out, right? I mean, your, your you know, idealized processor that can transfer from your USB drive to your computer is a much more controlled system than a hadronic calorimeter where you can't have that many wires because that'll block the production of particles, right? So you, it's, a, it's a complicated, very constrained system that limits it to around um, 200 hertz. OK, thank you. So usually these experimental plots are uh, uh, plotted on mass on y-axis and event on y-axis, right? So what that uh, mass and event, what is an event is? I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, when an experiment shows mass on the x-axis? And events on y-axis, usually the plots. Right, so the, so the what events, when they say events, events is cross-section, right? So events is usually differential cross-section with respect to that, um, uh, um, to that observable. So uh, the, the, the question is, what is the... When an experiment, uh, when, when an experiment plots something, what are they plotting? Uh, so typically, you might have mass, say mass square, mass on this axis, and events, right? But events, you should think of as this is the cross section, the differential cross section, with respect to the thing in the x-axis. So events and cross sections. So the bigger the cross section, the more events. They're directly proportional. So there's some units here which is usually the, the total cross-section, say the total PP in elastic cross-section, um, or the total number of events when you just integrate over the plot. So if you have something like this for a resonance, um, when I sum, so this will be a histogram, right, because I put them in discrete bins. Um, uh, when you sum over these number of events, you get the total number of events, which is the same as the integrated differential cross-section. So if I normalize this, so, so this integral is equal to 1, um, or it can be equal to the total number of heads. So the thing you calculate to figure out what this plot is is the differential cross-section. Um, and then up to a rescaling, it gives you the same curve as they measure where they count the number of events and put them in bins. Now we'll, we'll talk about a number of examples of this when we, when we talk about observables. But that's the thing they're measuring. So this is the same thing I was talking about the total cross-sections, but then you can also ask the differential cross-section, which means Suppose I want the total, the total cross section for Higgs to gamma gamma might be um, a nanobarn. Um, I'm sorry, a femtobarn, something like that. Uh, but then if I ask for the photons to be, have the, the invariant mass of the photons to be within 125 GeV, so this might be um, you know, 125 to 126 is this bin, um, and this would be 120 to 121 would be this bin. So then I just count how many events did I get where the invariant mass of the photons was between 121, 120, 
and that's the same as the differential cross-section with respect to the, the two-photon invariant mass for Higgs boson production, which I can calculate quantum field theory, and then I would integrate that from the left side of the bin to the right side of the bin as my theory prediction and compare it to the data, which is the number of events in that bin. So up to a normalization, it's exactly the same. So we'll see some examples of this. Questions? Okay, so uh, the next topic is what are the kinds of things that we uh, measure? So this is, this, now we know how the, what the experiment can do. We've talked a little about triggers. Uh, we want to know what, is, what do we want to look for and how do we find different kinds of theories and different signatures um, of different systems. Um, So let's talk about um, let's talk about the kinematics of a proton collision. So protons come in. Um, proton is roughly speaking three quarks, right? So you might have an up, up, down in a proton. And then I have another one here, which is up, up, down. Uh, but of course, it's not really three ups and a down. There's all the stuff holding it together, which are these gluons. So you can think of like gluons as kind of being there too. Um, right? And you can also have virtual particles. So I might have a strange quark and an anti-strange quark. And there's some probability that anything's produced because it's, it's roughly speaking, a bound state of three ups and downs. But you can also scatter the gluons that are binding it, but also virtual production of, uh, of strange quarks, right? So a strange quark is around 100 MeV, um, which seems like a lot. It's a significant fraction of the energy of a proton, but it's not a significant fraction of the energy in the collision. So if we're colliding things at uh, 13 trillion electron volts, uh, the fact that you have 100 million electron volts isn't a big deal. And so that energy can easily turn into the production of uh, a strange, anti-strange pair. So essentially, you think of a proton as a big soup full of lots of particles. Um, some are, uh, you know, some are uh, more, more likely to be found than others, but, but any time you collide two protons, what you're expecting is that not the whole proton collides, but you're hoping that, that one particle, say an up from here and, I don't know, a strange from there, um, uh, uh, might collide. Let me, let me pick a different particle. Let me say up bar. Up bar. So there's an anti-up quark that might, might collide. Um, so anytime a proton collides, basically a lot of things are colliding at once, but almost all of that carries a negligible fraction of the proton's energy. Um, but sometimes there's a probability that you get a hard scattering where some particle in the proton carries a significant fraction of it. Right? And a significant fraction doesn't have to be very significant. So if we want a 100 GeV Higgs boson and a 13 TeV collision, right, that's a factor of a hundredth. Right, so it only has to be one out of every hundred um, uh, of the energy of a proton goes into this uh, and this together, but it could happen, right? And so what you end up having is two quarks might scatter, and then you have whatever your, your Feynman diagram is for scattering of the partons within the proton. Um, and the thing that tells you the probability of finding a, a, a quark with a given energy is called the parton distribution function. Uh, I'll, I'll get to those. Um, in a minute, but the main point is that uh, what you're, you're doing is you're, you're picking out some particle within the proton that carries some fraction of the proton's energy, right? So the proton might have momentum, uh, PZ is 6.5 TV going this way, um, and energy would also be 6.5 TV, and this proton would be coming with PZ is minus 6.5 TV, and energy is 6.5 TeV. Um, but this, this quark inside it would only have some fraction of that, right? So this guy might have uh, PZ is 100 GeV, right? And energy is 100 GeV, something like that, right? And this guy might have uh, PZ, uh, what are my signs here, is say minus 50 GeV.
right? So this is a hard collision. This is a very small fraction of the proton's energy is in that particular quark. Um, uh, yet from the point of view of the partonic collision, it's a very high energy collision um, with a center of mass energy of, well, a total energy of 150 GeV. But the point is, typically, these are not going to have the same energy, right? And they're not going to have the same component of momentum. And so that means most collisions in, at, at the LHC will be very asymmetric. So most of the time, the net momentum of this, so the total as uh, PZ is 50 GeV, right? So the whole thing is going off this way. So what that looks like is you have proton collide, um, and then you might end up with two particles going off like that, right? So they're very often asymmetric, right? So a typical collision, well, I should, I should draw it in the frame. So you might have particles, one going this way and one going that way. Right, so it doesn't look like momentum is conserved, but that's because you're having an asymmetric distribution of the momentum of the original proton going into the parton that collided. And then when these partons collide, momentum is conserved here, but the net momentum is still, is still boosted in a particular direction. Right? So, so the point of view is that this frame, what we're not so interested in is the collision in the, in the lab frame. What we want to do is construct things that can measure this independent of of the relative fraction of the proton's energy that went into it, right? All I care about is this partonic, if, if I know what the energy is of the partons that were colliding, I don't really care anymore about what happened to the rest of the proton. Um, so what that means is that I want to construct observables that are independent of, this, of the net component of Z momentum in the partonic process, right? In other words, we want observables Um, that are boost variant along uh, Z direction. I guess I should also mention my coordinates here. So uh, typically we use Z this way um, and we'll use theta as the angle with respect to Z. Um, and then there's the azimuthal angle which is around this way which we call phi. So this is the polar angle, the azimuthal angle, and, and z. So we decompose things into that direction, right? Uh, so some of these things are already boost invariant along the z direction, particularly the azimuthal angle. It doesn't matter what, if I give the whole thing more momentum in the z direction, the azimuthal angle will be the same. Uh, but then the polar angle will change. So, um, and of course, the z component of the momentum will change. Um, okay, so what do I mean by this? What is boost invariant? What is a boost? So a boost is, uh, um, so I have some momentum, a four momentum, and under a boost in the z direction, I have to act with a boost generator. Uh, um, so what is this boost generator? So k, kz is like a rotation, but it's a four by four matrix that looks like cosine beta, zero, zero, hyperbolic sine of beta, Zero, zero, one. Uh, hyperbolic sine of beta. Zero. That tells me how things transform. More explicitly, um, the energy goes to energy times cosine of beta plus QZ times pinch beta and QZ goes to QZ cosh beta, pinch beta. So the energy and the Z component of the momentum mix up, and the X and the Y component of the momentum stay the same. Okay, so um, okay. So what this means is that uh, QX and QY, which are the components of momentum in the transverse direction, say this is Y um, and this is X, the components of momentum in those directions are boost invariant. So you can just measure those and it doesn't matter the, how much fraction that the parton had of the original proton energy. Um, uh, uh, it's independent of that, right? They're, they're boost invariant. Um, 
but the z component and the energy are not. So what we want to do is take a, a different combination of the z component energy that is invariant, right? So it's not qz and not e, but because there's a relation between hyperbolic cosine sine, cosine squared minus squared beta is one, uh, the, the, there's some combination of this that's invariant. Um, so let's see, let's see what it is. So motivated by this, what we do is we construct something called, uh, well, let me just write down equations. So if we consider E plus QZ divided by E minus QZ, how does this transform? Uh, so this goes to E, let me write, call this C, and call this S. So we get E goes to E times uh, C, and then QZ goes QZ plus, uh, so. so we get a, a C from here and an S from there. So C plus S plus QZ times uh, C plus S on the other term, right? So this is again, I'm just, E goes to E, eh, maybe I shouldn't. Write it out. Sorry, this cord is getting tangled. Um, e C plus Q Z S plus uh, Q Z C plus E S divided by uh, the difference between them E C plus Q Z S minus Q Z C minus E S. Uh, so the top is proportional to the product of E plus um, C plus S, and the bottom is the product of E um, minus QZ e minus S. So now let me multiply the top and the bottom by uh, C plus S. And then I get c squared minus s squared, which is 1 in the denominator. So again, I'm just going to multiply by c plus s over c plus s. So I get this is equal to e plus qz divided by e minus qz times c plus s squared. Plus s. Right? So what that means is that this quantity, this ratio of these different combinations, scales by a constant independent of what e and qz are. So no matter what they were originally, I know if I boost, I'll just have a factor that I can compute based on C and S. Um, and in particular, if I take the ratio of this quantity with this quantity for, say, a different particle, um, then that ratio will be entirely boost independent. Right? So the ratio of these things are boost independent. But rather than taking ratio, what we like to do is take sums and differences. Um, so if we take the logarithm of this, uh, a ratio becomes a difference. So this motivates us to define um, rapidity. Y is defined as one half times the logarithm of e plus qz e minus qz. So under a boost, y goes to y. Um, plus a half a logarithm of c plus s squared. So then t plus logarithm of c plus s squared is just a logarithm of c plus s. Right? So it just shifts under a boost. The rapidity shifts. Um, and therefore, differences of rapidity, so y1 minus y2, also known as delta y, Invariant, right? So what that means is if I have two particles in my vent, say I have an electron and a muon, if I ask me what their angle is, their, their polar angle and their z-component momentum, it's not very useful. But if I take the difference between the rapidity of the electron and the rapidity of the muon, that becomes a more powerful kinematic quantity because it's independent of the longitudinal boost. That is, it's independent of what the fraction was of the original proton, uh, their momentum that went into it. So I don't care about the overall z-component of the electron-muon pair. Uh, and therefore, distributions of this will be much more representative of what's going on in the underlying physics. 
So we almost always use rapidities to describe the angular distribution of particles um, at, at hadron collisions. But keep in mind, the rapidity itself is not boost invariant. It's only differences in rapidities that are boost invariant. But often it is differences in things that we're interested in anyway. Okay. Um, so a typical process, thing we might calculate is if I have two particles here, say, um, right, so I, this one would have, I can describe it by, say, PZ and theta and phi. Um, and this one will be 1, 1, 1, and then PZ 2, theta 2, uh, phi 2. What I do is I change two coordinates, which is PT, which is the transverse momentum, which is px, py. Um, because px and py themselves are boost invariant, the transverse momentum is boost invariant. So this is just a two vector orthogonal to the beam. Um, uh, we also can talk about, um, uh, so we can talk about delta y, um, and we also talk about uh, delta r, which is the square root of, uh, uh, delta y squared plus delta phi squared. So the azimuthal angle is the angle between, so tan phi is px over py. So phi is the angle, the azimuthal angle in the xy plane. So that's boost invariant because p and x and py are boost invariant. And rapidity is boost, differences in rapidities are boost invariant. So this delta r becomes a kind of angular distance between two particles. In the, in the transverse plane. Um, so this is a very useful quantity because it's boost invariant, so we'll often talk about the, if you want to know how far apart things are in angle, the, what we mean by that is the difference, the, the root mean square of the rapidity difference and the azimuthal angular difference. Um, so that's a quantity we'll be using a lot uh, as well. Um, uh, so, uh, Uh, Excuse me. Uh, yes. Uh, I saw in uh, some analyses uh, it uses of uh, pseudo rapidity eta. Yeah, let me, I'll get to that in a second. Can you, can you wait a minute? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me go back over here. Um, okay, so now let's talk about a special case, which is massless particles. Um, and so the massless particles have their energy is equal to the magnitude um, of their momentum. Remember, m squared is e squared minus p squared. So if the mass is zero, then the energy is the magnitude of the momentum. Um, so then the rapidity for a massless particle is one half log of E plus PZ over E minus PZ. Um, so how do we think about this? So let's draw a little triangle here. So we have our, our polar angle here, PZ, and the transverse momentum. And the energy is the magnitude of uh, the total momentum. So the magnitude of the total momentum is PZ squared plus PT squared. So that's p, the, magnet, the, the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle um, is, uh, is the total momentum, which is also the energy. Um, so remember, pt here is square root of px squared plus py squared. Um, so that means that uh, cosine theta is uh, pz over e. So here, I can write this as um, 1 half log of 1 plus pz over e over 1 minus pz over e. So now I can translate it to cosine theta, which is 1 half log of 1 plus cosine theta over 1 minus cosine theta, uh, which is 1 half log of 
2 cosine squared theta over 2 over 2 sine squared theta over 2, um, which is log. So I square the 2's cancel, and the squares I can pull outside and cancel the half. So we get log of the cotangent of theta over 2. OK, so for massless particles, we have this special relation that the rapidity is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the polar angle. Right? But this is a little weird, right? Because uh, we said the rapidity is boost invariant, but the polar angle isn't boost invariant. So how is this consistent? Question for you. Seems like we have a contradiction, because this thing changes under boost, but the rapidity doesn't. What? If it has massless particles? Well, that's one possibility, but it can. What's that? Invariant. The difference is still boost invariant. That's right. The difference is still boost invariant, right? So I never said rapidity was boost invariant. Right, what we said was the differences in rapidity are boost invariant. So there's no contradiction here, because rapidity isn't boost invariant, and neither is theta. Right? But the differences in rapidity is, well, be, well, they're not going to be differences in thetas. They're going to be some complicated combination. And that complicated combination happens to be boost invariant. Um, so what that motivates us to do is define another quantity. Um, so we define. Pseudo rapidity, rapidity, eta, is defined as the logarithm of the cotangent of theta over 2. Right? And so massless particles implies that eta equals the rapidity. But for massive particles, they're not equal. Um, but importantly, this, so this quantity, so uh, delta eta, um, it, are, are the changes, let me ask you, are the differences in pseudo rapidity boost invariant? Right. So, in general, they're not. The differences in rapidity are boost invariant. For massless particles, differences in uh, pseudo rapidity are boost invariant. But for massive particles, differences in pseudo rapidity are not boost invariant. Is boost invariant only for m equals 0? Otherwise, they're not. Um, so you should, so, but nevertheless, at the LHC, almost all the particles are effectively massless. As I said, they're almost all pions. And pions are really, ma you can think of them as massless. I mean, their mass is so small compared to their energy, typically, that we can treat them as massless. So pseudo-rapidity becomes practically equivalent to rapidity in almost all situations, except when you talk about something like the rapidity of the Higgs boson, the rapidity of the W boson, right, which their mass is significant, or the rapidity of the top quark. Um, and then you have to be careful. But mostly we talk about the rapidity of their decay products. So we won't talk about the rapidity of the Higgs itself. We'll talk about the rapidity of the photons to which a Higgs decays. Um, and then the rapidity and pseudo-rapidity are used interchangeably. Uh, but the important point is that rapidity is a kinematic quantity. While pseudo-rapidity is a geometric quantity. Right, so, pseudo, so rapidity is defined this way in terms of having things having to do with the form momentum, the energy and the momentum, while pseudo rapidity is defined in terms of the polar angle as measured in the lab. Right? So people will use them interchangeably. They're only interchangeable in the context of uh, massless particles. Um, for massive particles, they're different, but things are effectively massless, so it's usually a good approximation. Um, to, to give you a sense of what pseudo-rapidity looks like, so we define at theta equals zero, um, actually, we, we usually call this theta is pi over two. Uh, I mean, not right on the one that you can't see. Um, So typically, so this will be eta equals 0, theta is pi over 2. 
Well, over here is uh, theta equals zero, eta equals plus infinity, and this is eta equals minus infinity, theta equals pi. So theta is going this way, um, and rapidity kind of goes out from both directions. Right? But um, so typically you'll have something like eta equals one, so rapidity of one, pseudo rapidity of one corresponds to theta is 40 degrees, so this is 40 degrees. Um, eta equals two, this theta is uh, 15 degrees. And then down here, uh, eta equals four, theta is two degrees. Uh, the LHG detectors only go up to uh, pseudo rapidities of five, uh, which is around one degree or less than one degree. So even though five maybe doesn't seem like such a big number, um, in terms of angle, it's actually very, very close to the beam line, less than a degree. Uh, the best calorimeters go down to eta of three, which is about 10 degrees. So the, the, the tracker, for example, only can measure particles in the, in the region up to a, a rapidity of around, um, a pseudo rapidity of around three. But typically, these are the units we're using. So, so most of the, the, the highest resolution information is between rapidities of plus one and minus one, um, which is angles around 40 degrees, which is you know, about half of everything you can, you can see. Um, but keep in mind that most collisions of the LHC have one small x and one large x. That is, they're very, very boosted. So you'll have most of the stuff going this way and most of the stuff going that way. However, the highest energy stuff will be more likely to have be roughly central. So like dijet production at a TEV will almost all be in the central region. And we'll get into some of that more when we talk about uh, parts and distribution functions. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the kinematics of the detector. Um, I guess next time we'll, we'll talk about uh, some more observables and um, um, get into how we see different kinds of particles. Uh, so let me take some, some questions in the last few minutes and we can continue it in the discussion session as well. Yeah? Would we show it? What, what about pseudo rapidity? <laughs> rapidity is equivalent to angle. The relation between pseudo rapidity and polar angle is this one. So you know exactly where something is in the detector, you can tell me exactly what pseudo rapidity it's at. Mm. So you just take the logarithm of the cotangent, which is roughly linear in the angle near 8 equals 0. For example, uh, pseudo rapidity equal to 2.5. Uh, where is so that's in a over detector? Here. Yes, in a, in a detector, uh, in end cap or barrel, or the middle of detector. What's the question? That's true, 8 of 2.5 has a region in the middle and also goes into the end cap. Yes, uh, I want to draw a detector and... You want to see where the di different regions are? Well, I was trying to sketch that. I mean, I, it's hard to draw, but I, I can show you a slide of it. We can okay. dig one up. Um, actually, I might have one here. Let me see if this thing is still working. No, that's not working. I think my battery died. It's right. I'll show some slides next time. Oh, I'm out of battery. No, it's okay. I'm out of battery. It's not going to work. Uh, I, I, I mean, what can I say? The, I told you, the, the central region goes up to a rapidity of around three is the, is the kind of cutoff for the highest resolution stuff, right? The barrel, I think 2.5 starts, starts probing the end cap, for Atlas at least. Okay. Um, uh, yes? Defining boost generator, you why, use. Why, why you am I defining boost? You mean a boost generator? Because we're interested in Lorentz invariant Case. quantities, right? Because yes. it's a relativistic collider. Yes. So we want to know under a, a, a change in the overall z component of the momentum, how does it affect the energy of the particles, right? It changes by a Lorentz boost. That's what I mean. That's no, what. I'm, actually, I just wanted to use, uh, understand like why you were using hyperbolic functions. Why? Why? Do, where do they come from? Yeah. So they, they're 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 invariances of. The, so if I look at something that's Lorentz invariant, like the momentum or the differences, so suppose I want something like the, the invariant mass of a quantity. So I have the two photons and I want to look at the Higgs, so that's the momentum of one minus the momentum of the second one squared, right? So that difference in mass squared is Lorentz invariant quantity, which means it's invariant under exactly that transformation that I wrote down with the hyperbolic function. So it's a generalization from rotations, which have sines and cosines, to 
uh, uh, invariant when you have energy transforms with an opposite side because it's a, the signature of the Minkowski metric is different from the signature of the Euclidean metric. Uh, yeah. Um, so I see that the definition of your angular separation squared is like delta phi squared plus delta eta squared. And I was wondering if there's like a good theoretical reason to weight them by the same number because eta is like some complicated function yeah, of the angle. Yeah, so it's not really. It looks complicated, but, but actually if you expand in the central region, this becomes uh, theta minus pi over 2 um, plus higher order things. So this is it's really, in the central region, it becomes linear, right? And, and that's mostly where we use it. Um, it's linear over much of its range, and it starts to get nonlinear near the end. Um, but it's basically the same. Right, I mean, you could take any other function of this, and it would be also invariant, right? But, but we choose this function so that it, it has this nice property. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I should have mentioned that. There's a question over here. Yeah. Third, third from the top. Uh, tracker and ECAL have coverage up to eta equal to 3. So can I say that uh, charged particles are measured up to rapidity 3? You can say that the tracks from the charged particle are measured, but there's also sensitivity to other features of the charged particles. Uh, like? So it's like the energy, right? So the, the calorimeter, so it depends what they are. Like a proton will show up in the hydronic calorimeter, which is higher rapidity. There's also the forward end caps, which have, which have calorimeter information as well, um, which go to rapidity of 5. Okay, so, uh, so we can't measure the tracks, so we can't know the, the, the momentum, we can't see the curvature of the magnetic field, but we can still measure the energy. But we just don't, we can't tell necessarily if it was a, a neutron or a proton, right? They might have the same energy deposit, but we can't tell if it was charged or not because it doesn't leave a track. We just have less information. Also, the resolution, the spatial resolution is less. The best spatial resolution, if we want to know exactly where it went, it's helped it have a track. The, the ECAL grids are like this big. Right? So it depends where you are in the forward region. That's, that's a very large region of rapidity coverage. Right? But in the central region, you, you have very fine resolution because of the tracker. You know. so, you know. Usually for photon, rapidity is taken to be around 5. Usually photon rapidities are given? Uh, uh, usually we take it to be around 5 for photon. Well, the photons don't leave tracks, right? So you don't have to worry about the limitations okay. from the silicon on the photon. Right? So that, again, the photon is all from the electromagnetic parameter, which we do have sensitivity up to rapidity of 5. And roughly speaking, everything works up to rapidity of 5, except for the, 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 the tracker, which is basically rapidity of 3, but it's the strongest in the sensitive region. Rapidity of 1, you have the, the highest resolution, and then it degrades as you go out. And again, this is because we're mostly interested in high energy stuff, which is mostly central. Um, so we can, we can compromise stuff in the forward region. But for really inclusive processes, we need the forward region. And you can't do everything. Any more questions? No? Ah. Mm, I just wanted to ask, like, how is this concept useful? Like, just a relabeling of the coordinate theta. Uh, how is rapidity How is this useful? concept useful? Like, it's just like a function of theta, so I can just measure, measure the angles, right? Why use rapidity instead of theta? Yeah, yeah. because it's boost invariant. Because differences in rapidity are boost invariant, and differences in angle aren't. When you take this nonlinear function, then you can take a difference between two things, and that's boost invariant. But the difference in polar angle is never boost invariant. So it's useful for like uh, uh, making plots well, and distributions. Yeah, I mean, suppose. Uh, right. Uh, um, I, 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 you know, so if, so if I have two particles and I look at their difference in in angle, right? So this would be say theta one and theta two, right? That difference in delta theta, if I plot as a function of delta theta, yeah, I, I mean, I. I don't know what it's going to look like. It might look like that or something, right? Some crazy thing. But if I look at the rapidity difference, this might be sharply peaked, right? So I might have the same plot for delta eta um, might have a, a, you know, localized in one difference if they came from, say it was the decay of a heavy particle, say a W decayed to two particles or a Z, right? If I look at the, the angle between the two particles, um, that doesn't give me very useful information. But if I look at the, the um, the rapidity difference, this might be sharply peaked. So if I, if I knew the energy of the z, the, peak, the transverse momentum, then this rapidity would give me very clear information. Right? And because it's boost invariant, this thing would change. If, if the z was produced with more z momentum, um, then this thing would get shifted. So this represents that smearing due to taking a longitudinal momentum fraction. But there's no smearing here because it's invariant to that boost. So this becomes a much more powerful quantity. It's the same with differences. So 
So the, 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 the typical distance between these, if I look at delta r between the decay, that's a useful quantity and it's peaked around a certain value just like this, although well, theta is not. I know, of course, if I, instead of this, if I looked at delta of log, gen, log of tangent of theta, it would be, right? Because that's just a, a cotangent of theta. So if I take a nonlinear function, I get this nice structure. Um, since you mentioned inclusive cross sections, can you maybe briefly comment on the difference between an inclusive decay rate cross section and an exclusive one and a differential one? Uh, well, it's just that. The inclusive one is integrated over the differential one over everywhere it can go. So they're useful for different purposes. You know, if you want to know um, how many Higgs bosons I produce, I can just calculate anything that has a signature of a Higgs boson. But if I want to know the spin of the Higgs boson, I have to look at a differential cross section and the angle of the decay products, and that might tell me about the spin. But the total number of Higgs bosons wouldn't tell me that. So depending on your purposes, you sometimes want exclusive processes where I put restrictions, and sometimes I want ex inclusive processes where I just count. And would you say that exclusive ones are harder these days, or? Harder? Yeah, harder. Well, to calculate, I don't know. Exclusive. To calculate? Yeah. Um, w yeah, well, I'm not talking about calculating anything yet. Um, uh, it, it depends. Sometimes exclusive ones are easier to calculate because you have to do one less integral. Um, and so it's often easier to calculate something um, differentially than it is to calculate inclusively. Right? It, 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 if it's differential enough that I could just evaluate the matrix element, then that's fine. I don't do any integrals at all. That's the easiest thing but it's not very useful because it's just differential in all the possible phase space points. So typically doing phase space integrals is hard, um, and the more you do, the harder it is. But it's a trade-off. Um, uh, you end up introducing more scales, and so you have sometimes you get logs of those scales that make it hard. So you can do the integral for the exclusive process, but it's just not a good approximation to the all orders thing because perturbation theory is breaking down. So there's a lot of challenges involved in both. All right, thank you. Now, if you calculate a total cross-section with a simulator like MadGraph, Right? It'll calculate the total cross-section by calculating the exclusive one and integrating. Right? So there, obviously, it's easier to do it exclusively because it does one less integral. Um, depends on what you're doing. All right. Okay. Let's thank Matt again.